Well, welcome everybody. I'm Calypso Nicolaitis, Chair of CSOC. And indeed, uh, we're very pleased to have you all for the first week of our um, Hillary Term Seminar, which, as you all know, is entitled Global Southeast Europe in a Multipolar World and has been deftly uh, concocted by uh, our dear director of CSOC, of course, Ofana Anastasakis, who has really put together for all of us you know, a wonderful series with the help of the CSOX team. And, and, and also, and I think this is going to be a really great term. And I hope you all uh, come throughout the term. Um, the, uh, the, the whole program is available, so I'm, I won't go through it in great detail. But suffice to say that the theme indeed is about global Southeast Europe. It's about looking from the inside it, out and indeed also from the outside in. How, how does Southeast Europe <coughs> sit in a multipolar world in a very, very fastly changing and moving multipolar world? Um, and it's not for nothing that Othon has put this seminar together because indeed he's working on a book project, if I may just simply mention it, around these themes. And so it will be very interesting for us as a community here to think this through all together and, and, and explore these themes. Um, and indeed today we are very happy to welcome two very old friends with us to um, really launch, kick off the series and frame it around this theme of beyond Europeanization, European hegemony versus global influence. And um, our two guest speakers um, uh, after Othon frames the, the session for us, will be um, Spiros Economides and James Kerlinzi, both friends from LSC, where they are professors and also members of the Hellenic Observatory, uh, uh, deputy head. Um, and uh, we have worked together, I guess we don't even want to say how many years, on so many projects and topics around the region. We've seen the region change together and had conversation, sometimes agonized, sometimes hopeful. And so it's, it's wonderful to have this conversation today together. So what we're going to do, uh, without further ado, is to have Othon um, frame the issue for us, the geopolitics of the question, um, in, a, in a broad perspective. And then we will turn to Spiros, who is going to focus on Serbia. More or less, yes. More or less, <laughs> within the broader context. And, and finally, uh, James is going to wrap it up with, the, with some thoughts about Europeanization and beyond, and what <coughs> is beyond the beyond, what is beyond <laughs> Europeanization. So without further ado, I turn to Othon for an introduction on the topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Calypso. And um, I would uh, like first to uh, thank you for coming. But also uh, our CSOX team here, um, it's uh, David and Jonathan and Jesse. We've been working all together uh, on our Monday meetings to uh, put this together. And the idea is not just to have um, this team, which is very important, but also to create panels and have discussion and conversation on these um, uh, themes. And um, the, the main point here is what, what, what happens beyond Europe? Because we've been talking so much about Southeast Europe in the European context, what happens with integration, what happens with the Europeanization process. But it's also important to see these countries as, uh, as actors in the global arena, that they are receiving influences more and more now. And uh, it's not just about life uh, in the European context, but it also life beyond, and what kind of engagements and, uh, and relationships are, uh, are being formed and developed. Uh, and this, I think, is, is how we should perceive the region. Um, and that's one way, because the other way is also about lessons learned from the Balkans, the global Balkans and the global Southeast Europe, because there have been so many <coughs> diverse and interesting developments uh, during the past 25 years that there are lessons to be learned from the region that could apply to other parts uh, of, the, of the world. Um, and um, some themes that are there which are important is uh, about energy uh, or about diasporas because this is a very insignificant uh, agent of, uh, of interaction. It's about um, countries like uh, Russia or China. It's about the influence of Islam 
more about the rule of law and how this is addressed uh, in the context of the international community. So these are some of the themes of, that we will be uh, talking in the next uh, <clears throat> seven weeks, uh, eight with today. And I would like to start, as Calypso said, by as, you know, framing a, a little bit the, the, the strategic kind of um, uh, general uh, context of, uh, of the uh, global environment around the Southeast Europe and how it looks um, today. But before that, I would like to do a, um, a sort of talk of the different periods uh, after 1989 of the main hegemonic influences um, in the region, uh, which all of us know, but just to uh, very briefly, uh, after 1989, what we are talking about is mostly a unipolar world because there is the US hegemony, <clears throat> there is the victory of, uh, of the United States and what it represents over communism, over the Soviet Union, and in that sense, the main motto uh, for the region and the, the, the main uh, uh, orientation for the countries was uh, the United States. Uh, and um, it was also the main actor, because <coughs> for almost the whole decade, we've seen that the most organized actor uh, in, in the environment, the regional environment, was the United States, especially when the times were, uh, were, were rough uh, in Bosnia uh, or, or in Kosovo. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's very clear that during that period, we've got one uh, single actor and one single influence and orientation. And at the same time, the gradual building up uh, of the uh, European Union uh, coming as, a, uh, you know, as increasingly an important actor, shaping its, its foreign policy uh, or its uh, regional strategy in this uh, difficult environment of, of the Balkans, difficult and, and diverse. Um, and at the same time, uh, applying its, its enlargement uh, strategy in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And, um, so, and from a regional perspective as well, we are seeing the building of an internal consensus, gradual. Uh, in, in most countries, there were um, uh, dichotomies and there were disagreements, but there was a gradual building of a transatlantic orientation also from an elite perspective uh, in the countries themselves. And then and the next step is the post-2000, whether we've got the European hegemonic pattern there. Uh, and the influence is mostly coming from the European Union, which is um, shaping now a, a very consistent and consolidated regional approach and enlargement strategy for the countries. Uh, the United States are uh, starting to remove themselves from the regional picture because there are other um, problems uh, for them uh, in the form of uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalism or their own um, economic problems and social problems within, within the country. So this is the period of uh, Europeanization um, and um, the period when uh, Europe and the European Union is involved in the overall um, uh, uh, <coughs> state building and, uh, and, and institution building and the, the overall development of these uh, countries uh, in their aim towards Europe. And, that is also the internal consensus as well, because in all the countries we've got a consensus that the European Union is the main um, hegemonic discourse for them and the main um, uh, influence. Um, and then we've got the gradual building up of this uh, multipolar world in this period, but which is not that evident for the, for the region, um, uh, having Europe being so dominant, but it's post-2008. Uh, where the multipolar environment starts to become much more visible uh, in the countries of, um, of, of Southeast Europe. And this is where we are seeing um, Russia that had already uh, started to be uh, visible um, in the 2000s, uh, uh, starting to become much more active in terms of its um, uh, economic relations and its influence uh, in, in the Balkans. Uh, China, which is also a country that is, uh, that is rising, and we'll, we'll talk more about it, and also in this uh, seminar, but also uh, Turkey becoming more uh, independent in a way from the European Union and becoming also more visible as, a, as an actor uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Southeast European and the Balkan environment. Uh, and the post-2008 um, period is also a weakening of the European influence in some ways. Um, and that's why we've got the rise of multipolarity. There is not just enlargement fatigue, but there's enlargement inertia that we're seeing um, uh, currently. And uh, that is very much translated in the distancing of, the, of Turkey uh, from the European Union, and um, uh, uh, as I said, the, you know, the increasing uh, role of, of Turkey and its power in the regional environment. But it's also a period of, uh, of democratic neglect and, uh, and protest politics, and domestic elites that um, they are also beginning to weigh their different uh, alternative options 
um, because the Eurozone crisis is, shows a more weak um, uh, face of the European Union. And the, the, the once very, very powerful European Commission um, starts to weaken and, and, and uh, its influence uh, decreases. And uh, um, Europe and the European Union becomes more German, the German uh, Europe uh, that we um, uh, often talk about. So with this quickly, very broadly, the, um, and um, in a simplistic way, I would say this periodization of, uh, of hegemonic differences, influences in the region, um, there are even some um, articles and, and uh, um, like Bloomberg, Bloomberg uh, recently, uh, whether and how the, the Sarajevo syndrome is still alive. And obviously, it's the 100 years from the, the start of the uh, World War um, uh, One, and uh, recently with, with David and Elizabeth Roberts, we, <clears throat> we did a, um, a conference in, in June, hopefully it will be a book soon out, on the legacy of World War One uh, on uh, Southeast um, uh, Europe. But there can be some remote parallels of, of multipolarity then and uh, multipolarity now. And uh, the notion of multipolarity is actually what measuring power, uh, dividing between several poles uh, when the poles are the great powers, basically. And that's what it was during the 19th um, century when the balance of power uh, was uh, there. And then the early 20th century, well, that was broken, um, and which led to uh, World War I. And uh, what is useful for me to understand uh, the, the notion of multipolarity, and uh, I got it from uh, uh, an author, uh, Acharya, Anita uh, Acharya, uh, and from David Scott, uh, it's the distinction between strategic multipolarity and normative multipolarity. And um, that may be the difference, because strategic multipolarity, and, and that distinction, according to, to Scott, makes us also understand the different visions of, of multipolarity that the different uh, uh, actors, uh, uh, great actors in the, in, the, in the global environment may have. And especially he talks about the different uh, understanding of multipolarity from a um, European perspective um, and from a Chinese perspective. So the European multipolarity, the EU multipolarity, is a much more normative multipolarity. Like it, um, it kind of uses um, soft power uh, and multilateralism and advocates to, um, to rules and international law and international institutions. And then it's the other, the strategic multipolarity, which where there's much more emphasis on uh, on the hard power, whether this is military power or whether this is um, uh, hard economic power. And that was the case in, um, as I understand it, I'm not an historian, but before World War I, in that multipolar world, there was this kind of this strategic understanding of multipolarity. And that was shared by all players. Maybe what we are seeing today is these different understandings of multipolarity by the different actors. And that has its impact uh, in, in, um, in, the, in the Balkans and in, in Southeast Europe. Now, my understanding of multipolarity um, and how I kind of put it as a, as, um, uh, as a form in my mind is more like concentric circles rather than different poles that don't connect to each other. So if we want to understand the influences of the engagement of the region with um, uh, the um, the, the world, we've got the inner circle, the inner uh, concentric circle, which is Europe. It's the European Union. Uh, it's uh, this uh, normative influence that, uh, that comes. It's a long-term orientation, the one which is related with the countries in an um, internal, external dimension, and a, a, a domestic and an external uh, dimension. Both of them are um, a fusion of them. Um, and it's, of course, uh, uh, engaged with the whole um, uh, development of these countries and becoming a, a certain type of, of states that operate within a, a, you know, certain rules that um, are important in the European environment. And then we've got the middle circle, which is um, the countries which are of the neighborhood, uh, the former empires, uh, who understand it more in the strategic kind of sense. Uh, they use more the uh, hard economic power, but they also have a cultural and historical influence. And these are the countries like uh, uh, Russia or Turkey. And uh, both of them are very significant in how they relate to the region because there's a lot of history uh, between um, these countries and the region. Obviously, there's the Ottoman influence, which is very important um, and relates to people living today in one way or another. And there is also the, the, the Russian uh, past, which is um, uh, it's, uh, it has to do with um, uh, cultural links, uh, but also uh, economic and, and non-functional relationships. And um, in that sense, this too, it's like the, we're talking with Calypso, like the, emperor, the former empire striking back 
they became much more visible uh, after 2008. Um, and um, they started to invest more uh, in the countries, create more dependencies. Um, they're using their, um, their uh, economic instruments. And there is no conditionality, as opposed to uh, the uh, inner circle, the European um, Union, where there is conditionality, where there are rules as to how these countries um, uh, should develop. And that's why they're also getting their financial assistance or their carrot of, of membership. So there is no conditionality within this kind of, uh, of circle. And uh, there is this kind of relationship that is def in defined and informed by uh, this hard economic power, but also the cultural and historical links. And then there can be the, the outer circle, which is the continents beyond, uh, again, as Calypso and I have uh, called them. And it's, it's about the rising uh, power of China. And it's interesting because China, in, in particular, is becoming uh, much more um, uh, forceful in its economic interaction with the region. Very recently, it has been um, uh, getting in, um, in touch with uh, authorities in Belgrade. Uh, they have uh, plans uh, in, um, regarding the Silk Road that they want to develop, and that is the uh, Central Asia uh, Europe uh, route. Uh, they have a special interest in infrastructure. <clears throat> they want to create the Belgrade Budapest um, High Railway. Uh, oh, it's also very important that they want to use the ports in Greece, Piraeus, and, uh, uh, and Thessaloniki. So there's a lot of interest uh, from China, <clears throat> which is, again, that kind of hard uh, economic uh, uh, influence that they want to project. Um, by the way, uh, going back to um, Russia, uh, and there I think there's a connection between Russia and China at present, which is very, very interesting. Um, Putin may have um, a dilemma now with, uh, on how to um, use uh, the region in his relationship with Europe, whether to use it as a soft underbelly of Europe. And if he does that, then whether he will try to use his uh, uh, strategic uh, um, orientation to kind of use the divisions of, of the region um, uh, in order to kind of uh, weaken also um, uh, uh, Europe further. Because as we know, Russia has a strength. Uh, in what's happening between Serbia and Kosovo, and as an important voice uh, within Serbia. Um, in Bosnia, there's also a big voice coming from Russia in that it supports um, Republika Srpska. So if it uses, uh, if Putin decides to use these instruments in order to keep the region in a weak position, that can be a choice as to how he deals with, uh, with Europe in general. And uh, uh, so um, finally, um, and I will finish with this, um, we, and that's you know, more of a hypothesis and a question rather than, than, than a statement, looking at how this kind of um, uh, scheme of, uh, of the concentric circles work and how the different visions of multipolarity, we may be seeing now the kind of weakening of the normative character of multipolarity as is understood by the, by the Balkans, and the, the, the stronger um, emphasis or the transition maybe to a more, much more strategic one. But that's something that um, uh, we can discuss. And that's, a, as I said, a general statement it's, um, that uh, uh, needs more analysis. <coughs> Thank you very much, Austin. This is a very grand and super useful presentation. We now need the PowerPoint that shows the concentric mm. circles and the knife. And that will come next. Uh, but indeed, uh, so let me turn to Spiros. No. Okay. Thank you very much, Kalipso. Thank you all for coming, and thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to uh, present a few thoughts on this panel this evening about whether uh, there's any uh, purpose and need to think about Southeastern Europe and the Western Balkans beyond the scope of, of Europe, beyond the scope of European hegemony, or beyond the scope of this idea, this, this concept of Europeanization. And when um, Othon uh, invited me to come and speak, and he fleshed out what the idea was behind the program. I had doubts. I had doubts whether I could sit here in front and convincingly make an argument that there is another game in town in the Western Balkans <coughs> apart from uh, the European Union. And yet there are uh, a number of, of issues which I think we should raise, and perhaps what I have to say are more uh, will come more in the form of footnotes to what Othon has said, because he's covered so much ground in his introductory remarks that I feel that what I have to say is slightly redundant. But nonetheless, let me see if I can just add a few footnotes to, to, to what he said to see if there is any scope uh, 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 to the meaning of um, beyond Europeanization, European hegemony versus global influences. And so um, I'll just deal very briefly with, 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 with three elements. One is just simply to have a quick look at what this European hegemony is. Secondly, 
to look at the nation of multi the, this notion of multipolarity, and I'm going to challenge slightly what Otham had to say, but to see how this notion of multipolarity may challenge European hegemony. And thirdly, just to spend a few minutes looking at the example of Serbia, simply because most of the items on Otham's agenda, and certainly on my agenda, uh, fit more neatly into what is going on in Serbia, Serbia's relations with its neighbours, uh, Serbia's relations with the EU uh, and with Russia and others. And perhaps that's a good starting point to try and generate some kind of empirical content to a more schematic um, conceptual framework. So the first thing I'd like to, to, to just uh, say a few things about is this idea of European hegemony. And this is rather trite, but I think I just want to uh, share it with you so we can have a common basis, uh, a common starting point. What is European hegemony all about in the Western Balkans. European hegemony in its current context, and that, by that I mean the influence of the European Union, comes in at least two forms. The first is an economic dominance. Now, whether you wish to see that economic dominance as one which comes through the form of conditionality and everything that's entailed in that, or simply through trade agreements, or, or <clears throat> the prospect of closer economic links with the European Union, it's simple to say that Europe's hegemony over the Western Balkans is in one particular dimension, economic. And I think we'd all agree about that. And if you look at it from the inside out, you will see that most people, nations and states in the Western Balkans, uh, have a desire to move closer to the European Union, to become members of the European Union, primarily on economic grounds. There's a strong rationalist argument, argument there. And James and I have recently uh, completed an article which is going to be published, uh, hopefully, in the, next, in the next few months, which makes this case in relation to Serbia. Uh, many people have argued in the last few months that as a result of the first agreement between Serbia and Kosovo, what we're seeing is the Europeanization of Serbia. And we've tried to test this and say, well, in fact, no, what's happening here is a, a, a cost-benefit calculation of what's in the best interest on a rationalist basis for Serbia, and that comes down primarily to economic considerations. That's the attraction. One major dimension of the attraction of the EU for the inside-out approach is economics. It's the economy, stupid. And so Europe's hegemony in the Western Balkans on one dimension is to do with economics, is to do with standards of living, it's to do with the benefits of having a close or closer relations with the European market and everything that goes along with it. The second dimension, which is equally important, perhaps losing some significance uh, <coughs> now, <coughs> is uh, the European hegemony that comes, uh, 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 that comes with this idea of Europe as a normative power, uh, with the value-based approach of European foreign policy and the value-based approach of Europe's relations with its near abroad and beyond, but especially with those countries that have some European perspective, especially with those countries that have the prospect of becoming members of the European Union. And this normative uh, power Europe approach, or I think it's probably better to say this value-based approach, is one which the European Union projects and ultimately says, this is the way we behave internationally, and this is the way you ought to behave as well, especially when we're talking about international relations. There is a proper way of conducting yourself in terms of international relations and in a very specific kind of international system that we want to try and help shape. And if you can't fit into that system, then there's no chance of you fitting into our smaller club, our smaller club known as the European Union. And if you put this economic hegemony and the hegemony of a more ideational sort, which is value-based, together, you get a pretty potent mix. And that potent mix can be very attractive. Hence, we talk about the EU's power of attraction and the EU's ability to influence others, especially those who have this European perspective, uh, because of this attractiveness. On the other hand, it can also cause antagonisms. It can be overbearing. It can uh, raise the hackles of those who are on the receiving end of a rather heavy set of policies and uh, sometimes rather moralistic and paternalistic attitude about what you should do and what you can do and what you ought to do if you want to become European. This is the notion of, of European hegemony in the Western Balkans post-2008, if you want to use that cutoff point. So, and there are others. I'm not going to go into the various other perspectives. I'll just stand on those for, for the time being. So we've been asked to challenge this. In the context of today's uh, discussion, we've been asked to challenge this and say, can we think beyond European hegemony? and see what kinds of other challenges and opportunities uh, are there uh, in this part of Europe, which can help us think in different ways about their orientation, their future, uh, and what ambitions they may or should have, uh, uh, apart from the European perspective. 
And the first point is, if you take a country like Serbia, but you can take others in the region, uh, you, the first point to make is that there are all sorts of internal reasons why this notion of European hegemony is challenged. And often in his, in his remarks, uh, mention the fact that there may be democratic neglect, there may be corruption, there may be the cult of personality, there may be ethnic problems, there may be a long-term uh, uh, idea that, you know what, if we haven't made it into the European Union 20 years after the end of the Bosnian War, what are we doing? Why is it that we should pursue this particular avenue? We're given crumbs, and yet there's no uh, finishing post in line. We are being neglected uh, as compared to the attentions of the EU with other states. So there are internally generated objections, there are internally generated currents which challenge the idea of European hegemony. Some of, this, some of these are ethnic, some of these are racial, some of these are cultural, but nonetheless they're highly political, and they're very politicized, and they can be manipulated by uh, domestic political, political forces. So beyond European hegemony, in one sense, comes from within. It comes from within societies and nations that have been, uh, in a sense, on Europe's fringes uh, for the best part of, of, of 20 years and feel that they ought to get a better deal somehow. And as that deal's not yet on the table, then they have to think about alternatives or to react in a completely negative way. Second point, and perhaps more importantly, and this touches on uh, something that Othon raised uh, in two ways. Othon raised the question of multipolarity, and into that framework he, fi he fitted uh, Russia, which is a current example which all of us trot out in one way or another to suggest that there's a shift of balance in the international system and that we're moving away from the unipolarity of the immediate post-Cold War and beyond not just to include the European Union, but other actors who are highly influential or are becoming highly influential in terms of shaping the international system. Now, I don't want to stick on this idea of multipolarity because I still don't think we live in a multipolar world, at least not the kind of multipolar world that Alton was painting. But certainly, it may be useful to think of it in a slightly different conceptual way. And that is to say that countries like Russia, and it's par excellence the best example, uh, are revisionist powers. And they are powers which are challenge, challenging certain assumptions that have been rooted in a Western interpretation of the post-Cold War international system. And they're challenging certain assumptions which are to do, for example, with the use of force. Just one, one example. Uh, secession. Uh, and lots of others which I'm sure are all uh, very familiar. Basically, in the European context, in the Western Balkans, you can see that Russia is challenging European hegemony in this way. If the EU was the only game in town in Serbia until five, six years ago, four years ago, now it's not. Russia is a very significant actor, for example, in Serbia. And why is it a significant actor, and why does it want to be a significant actor, are two very important considerations. How is it a significant actor? Again, often outline some of this. The politics of the relationship between Serbia and Russia uh, are to do with Kosovo are to do with uh, Russia's status as a P5 member in the United, uh, United Nations Security Council. They could also, to do, could also be to do with a version of pan-Slavism, or at least an interpretation of pan-Slavism. They could be to do with the use of history to create uh, figments of imagination about how close the relations are and have been between two peoples and not necessarily just two states. There could be a sense of victimization, which is something that uh, the Serbs find very easy uh, to fall into the trap of doing uh, when it comes to a discussion about who they are and what they are in the European context, and something that the Russians also, of course, uh, uh, use in their favor in trying to enhance their relationship with Serbia. So the politics of the relationship is intriguing, it's complex, and it's to do with a variety of different uh, rational but perhaps also uh, cultural and other assumptions that are embedded in the relationship. There's a strong economic relationship there. There's strong economic links. And those links challenge European uh, hegemony in the economic dimension. Why? For example, in the sphere of energy. In the last few years, uh, Russia has been uh, increasingly involving itself in the Southeast European energy market, in the Western Balkan energy market. And one thing that it's done, snapped up enterprises uh, in Serbia uh, to do with energy, especially refineries and so on and so forth, which make it a big player in the region, make it a phenomenally important player in Serbia and challenge the hegemony of the European Union in all aspects of its policies. How can the European Union be convinced that it can impose a policy of regional cooperation in the field of energy in, in the Western Balkans when Russia is such a significant player in one of the most important actors in the region? 
here's just one example of what this is about in terms of challenging Europe's economic hegemony. There are other investments. There are other Russian investments uh, in, in, um, in Belgrade and in Serbia as a whole. And certainly, uh, James and I were talking to a, a mutual friend of ours, a high-ranking diplomat just last week, a Serbian diplomat, who was telling us quite clearly that, for example, Russia is now buying up, uh, buying into media in Serbia and creating a big influence in the world of uh, telecommunications and especially the media, which is going to have an impact on the ability of Russia to circumvent Serbian governments and appeal directly to a population which is not averse to listening to what Russia has to say. So in this sense, uh, there is an economic dimension which goes beyond simply money. There's an economic dimension which goes simply beyond investment. There's an economic dimension which has a direct uh, recourse to a population which in a sense, is already willing to listen. And that challenges Europe's economic hegemony as much as it challenges its ability to influence the minds of the population of Serbia. And lastly, of course, is there are lots of regional geopolitical considerations which I don't need to, 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 to go into now because I'm sure you're all familiar with them. So my point here is perhaps a, a rather schematic one, but this idea that we're not necessarily dealing with a multipolar world yet, but certainly we're dealing with a world in which there are states like Russia, and as I think this is the best example, which are challenging the established order. They are revisionist powers. And one of the things we see in the Western Balkans is that a country like Russia is challenging the hegemony of Europe in a variety of different ways, especially in this example uh, of Serbia. <coughs> uh, a second point, relate, oh, sorry, a third point in, in which we can try and look at the challenge to European hegemony, again, often covered this. China. And now, I don't want to call China a revisionist power in the same way uh, that I would call Russia, but certainly China is more than simply an emerging state. And it's a state uh, which, in its own uh, geopolitical backyard, has uh, a potency and influence, uh, which is a challenge to the authority of the United States of America. But certainly, it's also becoming a global actor in a variety of different ways. And all of you are familiar with the fact that in the last uh, 15 years, China's become one of the most important <coughs> actors in Africa. So Asia, Africa, and now we see that it's becoming increasingly active in Southeastern Europe. In a sense, uh, I don't want to use the word, the term soft underbelly that often used, but in the sense, you can see that there is a strategic, uh, um, uh, a very clear strategic picture here, which uh, the Chinese, Chinese have painted, in which there is one area of Europe in which they can challenge Europe's hegemony. And that area of Europe is the Western Balkans. And they are becoming increasingly active, especially in economic terms, with respect to the Western Balkans. Just before Christmas, I happened to be in Belgrade, and there was a meeting of 16 plus 1 uh, members of the Central and Eastern European countries and China as an investment forum held in Belgrade. And this is a significant step. What is China doing engaging itself with the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, including the countries of Southeastern Europe? holding a meeting uh, in Belgrade, a significant step. And there are uh, 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 a series of such summits between uh, uh, Belgrade and Beijing and other Western Balkan countries which are going to ensue. And China is active in Serbia. It's, open, it's built a bridge. It's promising to build a high-speed railway to invest in further infrastructure and so on and so forth. So uh, not a revisionist state necessarily, perhaps beyond an emerging state, and yet a challenge to European hegemony in this part of Europe. And it challenges European hegemony both in economic terms and in the more normative value-based terms. And lastly, uh, I will just use the example of the Gulf states to try and show that there's more to the challenge to European hegemony than a revisionist power like Russia or a more than emerging power uh, uh, like China. And you'll see that there is a, 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 a very strong and growing relationship between Serbia uh, and the Gulf states. Uh, Serbia, and especially uh, Abu, Dhab Abu Dhabi, which uh, has made uh, a real uh, commitment to Serbia. This is not rhetorical. This is not simply, we have friends in Southeastern Europe and the Western Balkans, and we wish them the best of luck. This is a country which has invested, for example, in the national airline. It's actually bought out Air Serbia, and it's trying to uh, create a modern European airline which will have a hub in the Western Balkans. Now, why is this? It's intriguing. It's an investment opportunity for the Gulf states, it's an investment opportunity for Abu Dhabi, which seeks to exploit investment opportunities 
everywhere in Europe, whether it's the Qataris buying Harrods or <laughs> whether it's uh, buying a football club in Manchester. But nonetheless, there is this drive to, to search for markets. But it's interesting that in a market like uh, Serbia, this is a challenge to European hegemony. Why isn't there a, European, a Western European partner to Air Serbia? Why is it that a Gulf state has jumped into the equation and said, no, we'll do this. We'll develop your, your, your airline, we'll develop your hub, we'll develop your, your airports, and we'll help you. Uh, and what do we want in return? Well, this is a part of Europe which is not yet in the European Union, so we could become increasingly active here without the restrictions of either the economic market, the single market, or the ideational power of the European Union here. Now, for Serbia, this is highly opportunistic. This is a good way of raising money without having to offer anything in return immediately. But nonetheless, the longer term uh, uh, implications of this are yet to be seen. So I'll stop there simply to say that uh, I, I need, we need to think about what this idea of European hegemony is before we challenge it and to see what kinds of uh, sequence of events uh, and what kind of actors are involved uh, in the Western Balkans uh, to be able to say whether there are other global influences which uh, resemble some kind of growing multipolarity which challenge uh, the role and nature of European influence in, in the Western Balkans. Thanks much and for bringing in uh, constantly this example of Serbia to illustrate. Uh, um, <coughs> thank you very much, Beres. James. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. and. Um, to, to echo Spiros, thank you very much to Calypso and Othon for a very kind invitation to come and speak to you. Um, if Spiros said he felt he was the <laughs> footnote to Othon, I really don't know where that quite leaves me because, I mean, they have both covered so much. Um, I will try my best, and I think in, in, in the spirit of, of, of Spiros' approach, maybe challenge something, um, a few of the things that they both have said. Um, I really think that it's, you know, when we consider the Western Balkans, and, and, and certainly in, in the EU context, it's, it, it is always important to bear in mind that um, I think we always need to consider it in, in the context of completion rather than enlargement. This has always been um, a sense in, in, in the view of many in Europe that this is, this is backyard that really deserves to be in the European Union. Um, this isn't, for example, Turkey, potentially Ukraine, um, which come with a lot of a lot of problems about what is Europe. I think you know we could all understand that this is um, quite clearly European territory as we we would all agree on it. Um, but I think it's also very clear to all of us that the EU has rather lost sight of this in, in, in the Balkans. And I think that you know this this um, is particularly troublesome in that it has opened the way um, for outside actors um, to start becoming much more involved. Um, but I'm actually rather less concerned uh, about many of the actors that have been mentioned already. Um, I, my greater concern lies somewhere slightly else. It's a slight different approach. Um, I don't think that Russia, China are major actors in the region or are going to have a massive effect um, in of themselves. I think, and I'll, I'll explain this um, you know, a little later on, my greater concern is what this means for the countries themselves and how they try and use the involvement of these countries um, for their own purposes. Um, especially in the domestic political environment. And I think that that's the real problem that the European Union has got to confront with, with dealing with these. Um, <coughs> Russia, as we're seeing, is absolutely dominating um, discussions, um, and for very good reasons. We see what's happening in Ukraine. But, again, I'm not so sure um, that we can really think of Russia as being a, a significant um, future challenge to the European Union in the Balkans. I think for a start, because Moscow understands that it, it, you know, it, 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 this is not territory that you know, is former Soviet space. Um, it's not on its borders. It can't extend um, its influence in the same sort of way as it can in the former Soviet republics. And you know, I, I, I think there is that understanding. And you know, it, one of the curious elements, I think, of what, what we've seen um, in, in the course of the past year um, is the extent um, to, to which you know, Russia is quite clearly keen um, to create um, problems, difficulties <coughs> for the European Union, but backs out very quickly. I mean, um, 
uh, for anyone who was following the decision to cancel South Stream, this was not done in any consultation with the Serbian government at all. It suddenly made the announcement and Serbia was taken by surprise um, and felt very let down by it. Um, you know, this was not the action of a country which quite clearly has a long-term strategic objective, as, as far as I'm concerned anyway, and looking at the way that it behaved in that way, it backed out of this, it made its own, its own strategic decision, um, walked away from, from the table and left, actually, frankly speaking, Serbia hanging high and dry. And I don't think that this has been forgotten um, by many people in, in, in the government. Um, I'll come back to, to, to Serbia again in, in, in a minute. Um, China, again, was, was brought up. Yes, it has been a very, very significant um, economic actor, um, in especially the infrastructure projects. Um, the railways, yes, the railway between Budapest and, and, um, and Belgrade has already been brought up, and there is also this discussion of you know, extending it down through to, um, to Athens, which would obviously be uh, a huge development. Um, as we've seen in, in Africa, um, China's um, investment comes, well, it, it doesn't come with any political conditionality. And this was one of the, the most interesting aspects. Um, you know, as was raised 15 years ago, um, we just didn't think of China as an international actor at all. And it has actually expanded massively. Um, I know, for example, that its dealings with, with Central Asia, I mean, it's, it's pushed out um, many Western um, well, one Western institution in particular, for example, like the EBRD, which was, uh, you know, had, had quite a lot of interest in, in former Soviet Union, was finding it increasingly difficult to deal with Chinese money, which didn't come with any, you know, attached ties to it. Um, you know, spend it as you want, and we're not going to make political demands. And I mean, this is certainly interesting. But again, I don't think, looking at what China's doing, that there is some sort of ulterior um, political motive there to challenge um, the EU in the Balkans. I think it's getting involved. It sees opportunities there, business opportunities, but I don't think there is a, 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 a particular political agenda behind it. Um, <clears throat> likewise, I mean, the, the, the question of the UAE um, is incredibly important, and I think that this is something that people don't often realise just how much, and, and, and Spiros brought this up, and uh, as did Othon. I mean, the United Arab Emirates really is, certainly in the case of Serbia, now considered the saviour. It's not just because they bought um, JAT and converted it to Air Serbia. Um, it's also the fact that, um, for anyone who knows Belgrade, um, the Belgrade Riverfront area, which is a very run-down area, is about, well, it looks like it's about to be redeveloped as part of a $4 billion um, project which is going to be funded by the United Arab Emirates. And the Serbian government really is actually throwing a lot of its attention into, into the Emirates because it sees this as an opportunity, um, really nothing less than to save the country economically. It's really that serious amongst, um, amongst decision makers um, in, in those terms. But again, um, you know, does one see some sort of evidence that, um, you know, out of Abu Dhabi that they're trying to challenge the European Union in, in the Balkans? No, I, you know, they, they, there seems to be nothing to suggest that at all. It's just simply about, you know, this is an interesting investment opportunity. They're willing to take on the risk that, you know, sadly, if we're to be honest, um, companies in the European Union just aren't. Um, I, I've spoken with a number of the, the, the Balkan ambassadors based here in Britain, um, and you should really, I mean, it, it, it's, it's fascinating to talk to them about their efforts to try and drum up, for example, British interest in investment in the Balkans. There is absolutely no interest whatsoever. Not one single Western Balkan country features in the top 50 of Britain's import or export markets. British companies aren't interested, and this is replicated across a lot of a, a lot of Europe. They just see this as a troublesome region. You know, they don't. You know, even though it's supposedly Europe, they're not really willing to get involved with it. In the UK, it's complicated by the fact that you know there is this idea of the Commonwealth as well. You know, this is not territory that we've had a lot of experience dealing with. Now, of course, this isn't across the board for all all EU members. I mean, Greece, for example, is a very good example of a country that's had very active involvement. So has Austria, but certainly in the Greek case. You know, we've seen that the difficulties of the past few years have had a knock-on effect. Um, and I think, you know, this is where the countries like the UAE and some other countries, for example, Malaysia, are showing a lot of interest. And they're willing to go in where European companies aren't. We're, we're seeding that ground economically. But I don't think that there's this political agenda that lies behind it. The one country which does really worry me um, in, in all of this is Turkey. There, I think, we have a real problem emerging. Um, you know, I would quite openly say five years ago, 
uh, even five years ago. Um, you know, I was a very, very strong supporter of Turkish membership of the European Union. I am now absolutely opposed to the idea of Turkey joining the European Union because of the direction it's taken. Um, you know, it's really, really, it, you know, it, to look at all the things. You know, I, I follow it on a day by day basis. It, you know, each day brings something that is just jaw dropping in terms of, you know, what is taking place there. So today it was the fact that four AKP ministers had resigned last year um, because of corruption charges. And then last night, the Turkish Grand National Assembly, dominated by AKP MPs, decided that it wasn't going to refer, refer them to, to, to trial at court. You know, this is just part and parcel. Earlier this week, Erdogan chaired the, the cabinet. He's making this a presidential republic out of the spirit of the constitution. All of this is taking place, which is a signal of the, the extent to which Turkey is moving away from the European Union, but I think obviously does, as we have seen, have very clear interests in engaging with the Balkans, trying to win it over. And I think that if there's one area that I would identify as potentially troubling of outside actors, um, that we do need to consider is the case of Turkey, supposedly a candidate for EU membership, but I think we can consider that um, you know, dead and buried now. Um, so to return to the, the, the central argument that I'm making, I don't really think, as I say, except with the case of Turkey, but I'm not even sure that, for the reasons I'll go into, that the countries are particularly interested in, in trying to follow the Turkish example. Where I think the problem arises now is that because Europe has... Um, to use that, that old cliche, taken its eye off the ball in the Balkans and allowed these other countries to, to get involved in, in, in whatever way. I think that this has provided the political leaders in the region with a very strong um, way of actually manipulating, if you like, their wider population by telling them, we have options. You know, don't worry about the European Union, we have options. We see that very clearly in the case of Serbia and Russia that there has been very clear examples of this, that you've got, you've got political leaders there, not the Prime Minister. I think it's, it's fairly safe to say that despite his recent outburst against the, the European Union, I think Vucic really does, and you know, for reasons that you know, Spiros and I covered in, in, in this paper, you know, understands that the European Union is the only game in town. But you've got the president in Serbia, Nikolic, who does firmly try and present this argument um, that Russia is an alternative. We don't have to rely on what the EU hands down to us. We can look elsewhere. We can, we can tie ourselves in with this. And, you know, it's, it's rather interesting, though, that the way that this plays out in, in the wider population. So the most recent opinion poll that was published showed that 54% of Serbs now support um, European Union membership, 52% quite how that stacks up, I'm not sure. There are some people who are very conflicted in their views, believe in closer ties with Russia. So, you know, that's a large number that, you know, you, you sort of, you, you sit up, you take notice. But there was a fascinating other question that was asked. Where would you want your children to be? 70% in Serbia said the European Union, only 17% said Russia. So there's this sort of pushback, if you like, this idea of this pan-Slavism, whatever it is that drives these notions. Um, but it's not really carried out. I think people in Serbia actually understand where their interests um, ultimately really lie. But there is a certain delusional aspect that comes in with this, that they see this. They see this with the United Arab Emirates. And I think that this is all part and parcel of this sort of sense of rejection from the European Union. The European Union isn't showing that commitment. There is real worry in the region, you know. Um, are we ever going to get in? Oh, but you know what, maybe, maybe it's all right because we can look at um, these, these other options. The, the other place I, I found where this is particularly strong is Macedonia. I was in, I was in Skopje early last year. Um, I, I have a visiting post at um, the, the University of Cyril and Methodius there. I gave a couple of lectures um, to um, students. The anti-European views across the board, all of them, not one of them had a good thing to say about the European Union. And this is quite clearly the result of media manipulation. And they would quite happily trot out these ideas. We have alternatives. We have Russia. We have China. We have India. You know, these are all places that we can look to. Why would we want to be part of the European Union? It's a big world. It's a multipolar world. We're going to be, you know, that's something that, you know, is very worrying. And I think, you know, but if you speak with Macedonian decision makers, they know that these aren't really options. I mean, this is a pushback against, you know, reasons that we understand. 
But it is nevertheless worrying to hear a population saying that. And unfortunately, the Prime Minister has used this very effectively to control a political agenda, which is becoming increasingly authoritarian on the basis that, look, we don't need to be part of the European Union. We've got other options. We're going to do things our own way. The trouble is that I think that this is going to lead to very severe, you know, um, well, mm -hmm. potentially very severe ethnic problems, because this is not attitude that's shared by the Albanian population in Macedonia. Um, you know, the, earlier this week, we had the Deputy Prime Minister come and, and, and speak, and, you know, in listening to him, he said that there was no alternative um, to EU membership for Macedonia, and it's quite clear um, in, in speaking with Albanians in, in, in Macedonia, they truly believe this, and I think that this is rather interesting because this ties in with the, the, the two places in the Balkans which I think are actually more safely European, which is actually Albania and Kosovo, um, but I think it, 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 it's very telling that this this sort of this way that they look at the world um, amongst the Macedonian population rather than the Al Albanian. Um, I know that there's a way of describing them better, but it, it's going to cause all sorts of problems if I'm recorded saying it. Um, but Albanians versus Macedonians, you know, this is this is this is something I think that we need to watch. Um, lots more that can be said. I'll just quickly touch um, Bosnia. Again, raised. Um, I think we do see this there as well that the Bosniaks look to the idea of Turkey. Is this another option? Is this something we could be looking at? The influence is growing. Likewise, in Republika Srpska, it's even more strongly used, this idea that Russia, Russia is going to be a saviour. You know, if we want to break away, if we're going to secede, you know, it'll be Russia that, let, you know, allows us to do this. Um, but even there, you get some interesting sort of stories about how they sort of say, well, we don't really need the European Union. This whole idea that we need to conform with Sadiq Finci because then we're going to join, you know, why should we give up on our political rights as they would see it in order to get into European Union, which isn't going to take them anyway? Um, let's look elsewhere. And this summer when I was over in the region, I had an absolute, I mean, it was, it was a fascinating but somewhat sort of amusing conversation with somebody um, from Banya Luka who was doing a lot of business in Nigeria. Um, you know, you can only wonder that that really was something to, to, to ponder how that business relationship would work. Um, but so far, so good. And the, the argument was, look, we have these opportunities. We can look further afield. Um, and they're, I think, really being fed this idea as well. Um, but then I, I think we also, on, on a final note, um, need to be careful that even for countries <coughs> that we think are actually more solidly ours, ours, Western now. Um, this lack of interest from the European Union does also have an effect, and the country I think of in, in, in most clearly for that is Montenegro. Um, now, until a few years ago, a couple of years ago, Montenegro was the country which was seen as being far and away the closest um, to Russia in the region. Um, Russia, Russian um, had bought massively into um, the Montenegrin um, housing market. They, they bought large swathes of the country um, and you know the, the, their biggest industry aluminium um, was owned by a Russian business figure um, so there was this real sense that Russia was dominating and then in this past year when um, European Union has called on countries to make their decision are you with us or against us are you with us or you know opposing Russia um, quite incredibly Podgorica has thrown its lot in completely with the European Union so one would say, well, you know, what, what does that mean? Well, the problem is that because of this sense of, of, of Russia getting involved in the region, um, I think that they're, again, using this as leverage against the European Union. Say, so don't go hard on us because, you know, we've, we've made a decision. It was very costly for us economically. It was very costly because it meant um, our ties to cutting our ties to Russia. And, I mean, Russia was very, very unhappy about this. I mean, they released a, a press statement from the Russian Foreign Ministry, which was you know, almost unheard of. Um, to, to, to be coming in so strongly against a country for having taken that decision. But I think there is this danger that the European Union would just simply say, all right, we'll go easy on you because we, you know, we believe that it's a strategic interest in trying to keep you on side now. Um, so I think just to, to, to wrap up on this, I, you know, I am rather sceptical about the value um, of, of attaching too much importance to, to these outside actors. Um, I think you know, they, they are important 
but not in the way that perhaps we're framing it, that, you know, they, they're going to be significant alternatives um, to the European Union. Rather, it becomes a very useful mechanism for manipulating the leaders in these countries to manipulate their domestic audiences. And I think, you know, this will have all sorts of negative effects in terms of the EU's ability to, to enforce conditionality, um, that these countries will stand up. I think, you know, part of what we saw with Vucic last week was actually influenced by the way that Erdogan has been behaving towards the European Union and Orban has been behaving towards the European Union, that they see this, they, they take these cues and without some sort of membership prospect, um, really clear commitment from the European Union, political and financial, um, then I think we're going to see these matters get far worse. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for all three of you. Um, for this great overview. And just before I open the floor, I, let me just say a couple of things, um, thoughts that come to mind in, in listening. I mean, I guess partly the big question that you've all kind of addressed is, is on one hand, how significant is this? And there's an array of, of opinion here. Um, but also, really, whether is this a waiting game, a transitional moment that might stretch for a while, but you know, the, the pre-enlargement um, uh, dynamic, or is it structuring and structural? And while I think to some extent um, you're all saying one way or another that it's a kind of strategic waiting game, you know, one question for us is to what extent can there be unintended or intended consequences, but dynamics anyway, spill over from this kind of moment of multipolarization, as it were, of the Balkans, which uh, will have influence and will be structuring, although so many actors think it's a strategic waiting game. So there's this kind of really interesting dynamic that you've all you know, addressed one way or another. And partly, I think, that has to, the question has to do with um, what both Othon and then Spiros went into the nature of European hegemony that is uh, unsustained. But again, how structuring is that hegemony in the region? Um, and what are its consequences? Is it a hegemon that can just stop being expansionary? You know, hegemons normally don't. They, they, they slow down, but they don't kind of give up on the game. Um, hegemons are supposed to be more long-term, playing long-term games. You know, we can go through the kind of hegemonic characteristics. Now, is it perceived in the region, maybe wrongly, that the EU has lost these characteristics, or is it true that it has? But also, you know, Spiros was talking about what's on offer from the viewpoint of the um, of the Russias and the Chinas, and, and of course, you all differentiate them in, interestingly. But again, the dichotomy there is, is very much from what you're all saying. Is it really an alternative to the EU? Spiros, you were saying, well, there's no rules. It's easier. G great, we can be in Europe without being in the EU. We have a, can, a, can have our cake and eat it too. You know, uh, China, port of entry, the, without the EU constraints, as it were, or not the same. There are some. So is this an alternative, or is this really a delayed? It, it's just a... a in view of delayed entry of the countries in the EU, so is it, is it really you know a detour for a relationship with the EU? And how are the two distinguished um, in the view of the others and in the view of the Balkan countries? Um, and indeed, I think there are some interesting differences between you. Uh, specifically, if we if we ask if if we ask distinguish between the views that the countries in question have of, of this Balkan strategy for themselves and the views that the countries, the target countries, as it were, have. And there's an interesting game there because Othon was talking about Russia and its view of the Europeans underbelly and what it means for its strategy. But the, Jen, James is saying, well, not really. I mean, it's not, that's not really, you know, credible. Um, so... And that's in part due to the strategy of the countries in the region, that they're not, they're not passive. They have agency, and that's what really matters. So whose agency is more important in this game? We could say, you know, supply and demand. But is it the agency of the big guys, the, the big Chinas and Russia and Turkey, or is it the agency in the region? Is it, um, um, and in that sense, you know, maybe it is the agency in the region. And 
it's kind of like Israel for the U.S. in the Middle East, you know, the tail that wags the dog, the, stra the European strategy that is kind of really, um, I mean, they have imp an importance <coughs> in this game that is greater, in, in Europe's game in the multipolar world that is maybe greater than their relative wealth. And that is, you know, fascinating, fascinating in and of itself. So in this kind of, and just to finish then on, I mean, there'd be many other remarks because you've, you've all said so much, um, that, you know, to, 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 to bounce off on, on, on James's point about so simply the, the strategic game being showing that we have options. If you don't want us, we have others, you know, I've got, uh, you know, other boyfriends or whatever, you know. Uh, but at the same time, as schizophrenia because we know we, who we really want to marry, you know. So, yeah, it is a classic game. So, you know, the, but at the end of the day, from what we know very well in this country, there's really this fundamental question that, and from around the world, is it to, to kind of play your part in this multipolar world, is it better to play it with the freedom of maneuver of a subregion or even a country, or is it better to be in one of these big blocks like the EU? And that, that's, the, that's the UK debate. You know, for, that you, but that's how you bounce back to anybody in the UK who says, well, you know, we don't want to be constrained by the EU because they're the Chinas of this world and we have to want well, is it better to do it from within the EU or not? And I, I don't think we should have preconceived notion of that because that margin of maneuver is quite important too if you think about you know, the strategic imperative of a country. So it raises fascinating strategic question. I really think we should all thank Othon because he's the one who's really for quite a while now has been thinking in those kind of broad global terms for the region. And it's such a fascinating avenue of, of thinking for all of us together. Spiro started his talk by saying, I'm, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about. Now, now you're not sure what you cannot talk about because there's so much to say. So, um, so in thanking all of you, and if you don't mind, we'll now open it up and then we can come back to some of these issues.